Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Thank you so much, and thanks for PCB uh, to PCB for hosting this uh, this interactive webinar. Um, I'm going to introduce also Nick. Uh, he's going to be talking mostly about the information security aspects today, and I'm going to be covering quite a lot of the risk management aspects. And we we both will also talk about some of the interfaces between those processes. So a um, little bit uh, of an agenda we've put together. First, uh, as I mentioned, my part uh, will be the, the good, bad and ugly of risk management. I thought I'll start with that. And then also aligning the risk management process with ISO 31000. So basically integrating the ISO standard into the risk management process. And also where or how does the ISO 27001 fit? So where, does, where is the interface between the two? Nick, would you like to do the outline of your part? And then I'll kick off with my part. Yes, um, I'll be talking, uh, thank you, Rinska. I'll be talking about uh, information security, as Rinska mentioned, uh, the good, bad, and ugly. Um, how can we um, align ISMS processes with the 27001 standard and also um, using the 31000 standard um, in uh, your ISMS? Great, and we'll finish up today with combined questions and answers, so please keep them coming. If you have a question for either of us, or generally uh, about information security or risk management, please put them uh, in, uh, I think it's in the chat that you can do that, or in the Q&A part. Uh, Albana, would you like to explain any of that? Is What's the best way for people to do this? Yes, uh, everyone can ask their questions in the chat box here in the platform, and then we'll answer them at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next slide. Nick, next slide. Yeah, that oh. should be the next slide. It might be a bit of a delay. Might be a small delay there. There it is. So a little bit of background on myself. Um, some of you may have met me in the, at a conference or at a webinar before. I've been uh, involved with PCB for a long time, for since 2012. Uh, I mainly started in the field of business continuity management, also more and more than looking at the enterprise risk side of things, because that's really the overarching part, of course, that uh, that that blues it all together. Um, and with business continuity, quite quickly, I noticed there was a lot of, I guess, haphazard methods that people developed on their own. And I thought, hey, the ISO standard would maybe be a good idea to follow. And the ISO 22301 is the, the one that I'm referring to here. And that's how I got to know PCB, uh, because they were already looking at training for people in that standard and also in some of the other interfacing standards, which became more and more relevant in my uh, world, because like I mentioned, the, the risk management part and then later on information security as one of the key risks came uh, into the picture. I've also got some certifications in crisis management. Uh, some of you who may have been to the Brussels conference last year may have noticed uh, we had a, a, a training course, the very first one in that new standard uh, 22361, the ISO 22361, that was, that's the crisis management standard. I was presenting that in, in Brussels last year at the uh, international conference. Uh, the Insight Conference, and you can see a few other references like organizational resilience, the 22316. Um, I'm based in Australia, but I've been doing business continuity, risk management and information security across pretty much five continents now. You can see some of the, the areas represented there, especially East Africa, especially Asia and Australia, of course. Uh, Latin America, I've done quite a bit of uh, project, quite a few projects there. And in Europe, I'm originally from Holland, so I use, usually tra um, travel to Holland uh, quite a bit or to Europe generally. So um, you see some of my examples will come from uh, all over the, the place, uh, literally. And I know that uh, the attendees in this webinar are also from all over the planet. So hopefully there'll be some things that touch on your world and that you can learn a few things from. 
So um, one other last item to mention maybe in there is the specific regulatory experience that I have in, in the context of the financial sector. Uh, I was working for a, a retail bank at the time when the Australian government started to do audits on all the banks and insurance companies on their business continuity and risk management uh, processes. And so I actually was involved in uh, developing the, the most suitable uh, process for that and uh, and together with all the banks actually recommending the government what they should be auditing us on. Next slide. So that's a little bit of that um, regulatory experience, you know, from the other side, basically from the receiving end, but also as a bank, but also from a um, regulatory sort of side. And, uh, and we see quite a lot of regulation happening in this uh, context. And this slide shows a client sample, some of the organizations that I've been involved in. Um, you, know, you, can, you can see all different sectors there. There's a lot of uh, government uh, entities in there, also globally, but also a lot of uh, larger corporates uh, and also some small businesses as well. So some smaller SMEs. Um, we noticed that they don't have permanent staff to do uh, information security and risk management and business continuity. So that's where we, uh, yeah, often uh, with my company that I started in, uh, in 2006, business as usual, it's called. Uh, that's what we also focus sometimes on because they're really the, the the group that is a little bit left out and uh, doesn't have the big budgets but we do focus on them sometimes as well next slide please so that's all across sectors so most of the things that i mentioned will be applicable to uh, to any sector and any size organization or i'll highlight any particular differences now the first thing i wanted to highlight here uh, which is not necessarily the good it's actually what i would probably call the bad and the ugly it's the old connotation of the term risk whenever we say risk risky business we think something bad right what originally originally we did and you can see there even on wikipedia if you look at what is the word risk referred to uh, in simple terms it refers to the possibility of something bad happening Risk involves uncertainty about the effects or the implications of an activity with respect to something that humans value. So that's all good uh, in the sense of the, the connotation there, but it's often focusing on the negative undesirable consequences. Next slide. And so that's really the old way that people used to think about risk. It was something you don't want. Now we then got ISO 31000 standard and uh, that latest iteration of that standard really emphasizes that really risk is just the effect of uncertainty on objectives. It doesn't actually say it's bad or good. In fact, we see it's actually a combination and it depends on filters uh, as I call them. So where one person or one company or one government entity might see something as a threat, as a negative type of risk, another organization or individual might see that as an opportunity. So as an example, you might see things like the global financial crisis or the pandemic, you know, we see that, oh, that's scary, that's bad. But it's also for some individuals and businesses and, and governments, it would have been an opportunity. And we see doing this webinar, for example, with so many people able to tune in, even that is an opportunity, right? Like the fact that we are all far better equipped these days with doing this kind of uh, uh, presentation remotely and working together that way. So it really just depends on the filter, you know, the person or the entity looking at a particular situation or a particular uncertainty and then labeling it as a positive or negative. The other thing that is worth noting is any business or any government or any organization really needs to embrace risk to to be able to survive. I mean, even if you're a fairly conservative organization, uh, you still need innovation to stay up to date with what other organizations are doing in your field and so on. So it's not actually something you can avoid. We can't really tune down the, the, the term risk to zero. And, uh, and most standards actually do acknowledge that and say well if you've identified a risk you can't really uh, mitigate it to zero it's an effort to reduce and reduce and reduce and uh, yeah it's not actually possible to reduce it to zero so the likelihood and the impact are, are two um, dimensions in the context of risk as most of you would know by now and those are the most mostly uh, our, our risk management efforts, our risk mitigation efforts are concentrating on reducing impact or reducing likelihood or converting it into a different type of impact, for example. So risk management is the coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to risk. 
And that's the, the definition as per the international standard. Next slide, please. So where the cat sees the mouse as an opportunity, the mouse sees the, the cheese as an opportunity. That's the, also the, the context there. So the good part here is the understanding that risk is not all that bad. And you can see here some examples um, where ransomware, for example, yeah, that's uh, that's not a, a good thing, of course, you know, it's a big threat. And so the good thing is that we do see that there's opportunities and everything, but that we also label certain events as not desirable and that we mitigate them and we try to do something about the impacts and the likelihood of those. Now, in terms of statistics there, you know, when it's all about uh, the threat of that, you can see um, the impacts, the financial impacts over time of a ransomware attack and that whilst we think oh we've mitigated this we've got it under control actually the impacts the financial impacts of ransomware often don't start appearing until a little bit later and even worse it takes sometimes 18 months to even know that you've been you've been compromised and your data is already out on the dark web and you don't notice it until much much later so whilst it's a major threat for most businesses it has become almost an opportunity for certain businesses. And I'm referring here to, for example, cybersecurity uh, specialists to help organizations prepare better. But also insurance companies these days are actually encouraging paying ransom, which I heard the other day, which is quite uh, incredible, of course, you know, where, um, well, if someone broke into your house and they stole your goods, you're now going to give them more money to say, please don't do this again. Um, you know, something like that is just, of course, uh, yeah, very un unusual situations. Um, directors becoming personally liable for cyber attacks. Now, of course, that becomes a real threat for especially the, the board of directors and for organizations generally, but it's also an opportunity these days to get much more visibility of risk at all levels of an organization. If you're one of those people who tries to uh, wave the banner, the flag for certain risk, we get now much more visibility these days because some of these risks, including cyber, are now being raised up all the way to the board level. It's not seen as just an IT thing anymore. Next, uh, next screenshot there. So you can see that it's all about the filters. It's about the, the way to look at something. Now, these are some of the other emerging risks, and Nick will talk more about uh, information security related risks, but you can see there, whilst we uh, often don't want to acknowledge how we're going to mitigate a risk, like for example, would your organization pay ransom? That question I ask many organizations and all of them blatantly uh, clear, clearly say, no, we would not pay the ransom because we're not gonna pay criminals money because we don't know if they're actually going to then you know, uh, delete all that data and uh, and stop spreading it. But um, in real life, we see that actually a lot of organizations in real life have paid ransom and are still doing so. The other day I saw a statistics around the, the 70 to 80% of organizations that were attacked actually did end up paying ransom in some uh, to some degree. Now here you can see um, a real opportunity where a risk, a, a negative side of risk was converted into a real opportunity where an organization, this is one example of an organization in Australia, they actually said, okay, we have been you know, uh, attacked, ransomware attack, but instead of giving in, they actually rebuilt their whole environment and started creating a completely new approach to their IT and they managed to do it. And so they actually converted that, that threat into a real opportunity. So it's just about what you do with uh, with those events. All right, now when something happens, um, next uh, screenshot please. When something happens, it's of course all about how you respond. And if you're talking about reputation, you know, reputational impact, it really is about how you deal with an issue. And most organizations acknowledge these days that these types of risks like strategic risks, you know, mergers, acquisitions, digital uh, transformation, product service related sort of risks, competitive position, et cetera, globalization, you know, those risks you can't really avoid, but once again, calculated risk, you know, do something with it in a um, constructive way and assess the risk beforehand and see the benefits and the downsides of it. Uh, the, even the term merger, to some people in an organization, immediately, immediately that's connotated with something like a big opportunity. 
for example, your innovation related people, you know, people who actually are looking for opportunities to grow the, the business, to grow the, the portfolio of products, they will see the term merger, the concept of a merger as a real opportunity on the, the positive side. If I ask an IT person what they think about a merger, they go immediately like, oh no, now we've got to merge systems, we've got to align all that IT, uh, we've got half the user community using different applications, you know, that's a real threat to their stability. So once again, risk has two sides. Financial risk, like market risk, credit risk, et cetera, that's a, another category there. Operational risk, that's what we typically connotate with things like business continuity plans. That's all about, you know, if your services, you know, your IT service, your staff, your physical assets, your supplier relationships, if they are affected. So your current environment of risk, if that's a, uh, if your current uh, operations, if they are affected by whatever types of risks, that's what we call usually operational risk. It's the current status quo, how to maintain that. And then compliance risks are the contractual related ones or environmental, workplace health and safety, et cetera. And ethics and privacy related regulations are becoming more and more uh, prevalent there as well. Please uh, tick that through. Um, so we've got these categories of risk. And the good part is that at least people starting to think about those categories and get experts to get involved in those different categories of risk. Not just, it doesn't just get dealt with as a massive risk register where people have dumped all those things. We see more and more grouping of that. So that's kind of the good part of uh, how people are managing risk these days. And I mentioned reputational risk. Well, that one can actually be related to any of these four. So if a strategic risk eventuates and becomes an event or a financial risk or an operational risk or a compliance risk, these four can all give rise to reputational risk yeah, and can affect the brand. Yeah, well, we typically see it uh, covered under strategic risk, but I would say any of any type of risk can give rise to a reputational impact. Please keep going with that. The bad and the ugly. So that's actually more the, the negative uh, developments that I'm, I'm seeing these days in the marketplace when we talk about risk. People are focusing still a lot on the causes and treating the causes rather than the consequences. So for example, in information security risk, cyber risk, we see a lot of focus on you know, penetration testing and reducing that likelihood and focusing on the cause of the risk rather than saying, what is our, for example, business continuity plan back to pen and paper if we have to unplug all the systems while we're assessing a cyber risk. And so I do see that as one of the, the items that is not so well managed. Treatment options and procedures to reduce impact often are not easily extractable from a risk register or from a risk database or risk management tool. There's, there's a lot of software tools out there that uh, are used to manage risk. Most of the time, there are big buckets of controls, of treatment options that are uh, either related to the likelihood or the impact, but the impact side is not easily extractable. And whilst an event is happening, a real event is happening, a risk has now become an event or issue or incident, you do want those impact reducing controls very quickly, right? So for example, if a fire is really affecting your building, you do want to know how to operate and where to get you know, the fire extinguishing equipment. Or if a cyber attack happens, you want to know where is the quick response plan or the cyber incident response plan, or where is our contract with our uh, cyber uh, security expert uh, partner, for example, and what are the conditions of that? How do we quickly get their details and get them involved? Those sorts of uh, treatment options uh, are often really, they're, they're sort of sitting in bigger databases of different uh, treatment options and controls. So. I would say that's not a, a great thing that is managed so, so well. Then we have uh, pro, uh, producing quantity rather than quality. This is, I, I see this all the time where there's massive risk registers, uh, also in context of, of business continuity, the big business impact analysis documents and spreadsheets. But actually, yeah, it sits there in those top software tools and people don't actually have time to manage it properly, to maintain it, to find the right people involved and to keep uh, enthusiasm for all of that. And it becomes a tick in the box once a year exercise to please the auditors. So that's another uh, another problem I see. Also maintaining these uh, these controls and all these uh, the documents around that become a burden. Yeah, and they, they tend to then be needed to get carried out by non-subject matter experts, by people in a risk functions, trying to make sure that they're actually on top of it, 
which is a problem because they're not actually working in those areas that actually are the risk owners and that deal with the controls. So that's another risk. And then top-down risk appetite and risk capacity are often completely unclear. So the top hasn't really articulated how bad can it be before it becomes an unacceptable level of risk. Everything tends to, tends to be, oh, um, zero harm, zero risk, that's our appetite. But if the reality shows that it, there's actually a lot of things going wrong, well, you better set some realistic targets and a risk appetite that makes sense to people in the organization and that they can build the right level of controls for, right? Next slide. So that's, um, yeah, the risk of over or under investing in treatments comes with that. Not knowing, are we investing in the right things? Flying blind, I call that. So these are some examples of typical risk appetite statements I see, and I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but you can see there the adverse, cautious, moderate, enterprising. That's all wonderful. You know, you say, see all the color coding and oh, let's call ourselves averse for particular types of risk. For example, for regulatory risk or fraud, we're saying, no, we don't want that. But in terms of uh, growth opportunities, the positive side of risk, oh, we're enterprising. These wonderful things are often workshop with boards and executives and given labels that are looking really nice, you know, but what I really want out of this as a staff member or middle management person is how do I actually measure that? So not just avoiding the risk or willing to pursue some sort of risk, but actually what does that in tangible terms translate to? And so what are the metrics around that? Next slide, please. So that's the, the problem with these things. It's often very hard to measure. People give things uh, colors and labels, but when things are happening, when the, the business is being run and certain risks are emerging, yeah, it may be given a color, but are you actually treating that risk to the right degree, to the right level? Of, are you implementing certain controls to the right level as well? Another example of a tip, uh, typical risk appetite statements are these sorts of things. We're working towards a position whereby we're not jeopardized by short-term revenue and cost fluctuations. This is starting to become a bit more tangible at least. It's better than just saying um, we don't have any, um, well, we have, we have high tolerance, for example, for revenue and cost fluctuations. That would be very generic. This one's saying we are trying to get to a position where we're not jeopardized by short-term revenue uh, impacts. Another example on this slide I might just pick on is we will protect partnerships with key long-term suppliers as high priority. At least it's made specific, key long-term suppliers. We mark them as high priority. At least that becomes a bit more measurable, but it's still, I mean, you know, would you actually be able to say, yeah, are we achieving that this year? It says it's a high priority, but are we actually giving enough metrics around this to say at the end of the year, have we actually done this? Can we say, yep, yeah, we've done it, or we've done it to 80% or whatever the, the target was, or, you know, so making it tangible and uh, measurable is very important. Smart objectives, we call it as well. And of course, the last bullet point, the, the thing I wanted to mention here is often we like to see something like that last bullet point as the first one, you know, so sometimes the priorities are all driven by the business objectives, by share value, and the actual staff are not uh, put uh, on the top of the list, but at the bottom, and that's not a good thing, I believe, because you need all the staff to work together on any of these other bullet points, right? So they have to be around and they need to be protected. So that's another uh, uh, symptom of some problems there. Next slide, please. So these were kind of the bad, um, in terms of the good, bad and the ugly. Um, I've also highlighted some of the, the better developments that I've seen. And here you can see another example there that you know, the, the risk appetite statements tend to be very long winded, a lot of text, you know, and you can see here, these are at least two, uh, the least two length, two least lengthy items out of a seven page table. So how measurable are these things? How are actually the rest of the staff dealing with this? If a board or executive even goes as far as, as uh, documenting this, will this actually be maintained and managed and will people measure themselves against it if it's too many words and i would rather see something that is hey for example this much percentage emissions reduction this year if it was about the environment or something that really can be tangibly measured even if it, it's a bandwidth between appetite and capacity you know where capacity is the stretch level and the appetite is what you really find the warm and fuzzy next slide please so 
what we see here, the better practice, the good, I would say, is risk appetite and risk capacity in that buffer, with that buffer zone between, where we say the risk capacity is the stretch level. And please click that one through so we see what risk appetite is all about. It's about smart objectives saying, what would we like? That's the green, fuzzy, warm and fuzzy area. And the buffer is where we usually label our risks or we rate them as amber, you know, the yellow zone. So risk capacity, risk appetite with the buffer in between. Next slide. So that's what I would say. That would be nice if you had some tangible uh, thresholds in between or for, or for both the red and the green. And you can then measure how you're progressing over the time and how you progress over the years as well. And you can start measuring or comparing apples and apples. And the way I do that normally with teams is this type of way where we have people working together. I often put executives and board members actually in an opposite position of what they have and let them really investigate a particular type of risk that is not so comfortable in their area that they don't know that much about, but that they actually have to start thinking about how does this work? You know, and what are the, the comfortable uh, appetite level and the capacity level, which is more the stretch level, and how to make that tangible in terms of numbers. And you can see here that usually creates some discussion. Next slide, please. And so that, uh, that's how we, we try to do it in a practical way. With this one, um, I wanted to highlight the uh, benefits of using ISO 31000 for risk management and how to align your process to it. The concept of organizational context and stakeholders is important. And please uh, keep uh, this rolling, uh, Nick, if you can. The concept of organizational context and stakeholders is something that's really emphasized in all ISO standards. So adopting the ISO 31000 is, is going to help you identify those and make sure that you don't forget any of them. Risk assessment and risk treatment as a actual structured process is another benefit of the ISO 31000. And the importance of, importance of continual improvement is a key thing that comes back in all the ISO standards as well as leadership and commitment. And please keep going with this slide as well. Now with this one, I wanted to ask all of you in the chat, if you can dump a little answer in there. Um, what is the reason why a car has brakes? Why does a car have brakes? Yeah, let's see if someone answers in there. And I'll leave that for a moment. Um, the last point I wanted to make is where does the ISO 27000 fit? And that is, it's dealing with information security risks. So it's just one of the many risks in the whole ISO 31000 risk management framework. So I'm not sure if uh, if we're already working out why does a car have brakes? I can see there to avoid collision, to reduce speed. Thank you for, uh, for responding uh, guys in there. So you can see here to reduce speed, if you're actually telling people at the top, you know, or in, in the more innovative roles or the marketing team or sales team, you say that, oh, we're here to reduce speed, you know, control the car, that's actually not what they like. So the answer I often give is the car has brakes so you can drive faster. Yeah, and that's the philosophy that I would really encourage with this is with all of this, with the adoption of ISO standards, but also generally managing risk management, actually encourage people to think without the breaks, without the processes, without the ISO standards, without the internal audits, et cetera, without the governance, we can actually not grow as a business. Yeah, we, we have to start slowing down a lot because imagine that you, your car doesn't have brakes, you have to slow down that car a lot. So that's the idea of uh, what I wanted to mention here. And I think we'll transition uh, into the information security piece uh, quite soon. You can keep uh, rolling the slides, Nick. There's a small delay with those, so you, you might have to click ahead a little bit for your part as well. Are you able to see this one, uh, Monsieur? Yep, all good. Good. Okay, thanks, uh, Rinske. Very insightful. Um, so um, um, hi everyone, I'm Nick. I've been with the PECB for about six years. Um, work as a senior consultant, a trainer and auditor in business continuity, information security and risk, um, uh, which also means that I have a number of certifications, including the uh, lead auditor certification for the 27001 standard. Um, I've, well, I'm, I'm from Holland, as you might hear um, the accent, but I'm based in Australia. Um, I'm a member of uh, ISACA, so I have my uh, Certified Information Security Manager um, 
papers um, and I'm also a member of ASIS, so I'm a certified protection professional. Um, and I've been consulting for about 15 years uh, for several uh, government entities, uh, uh, small, medium sized enterprises, and larger corporations in Australia, Africa, and uh, the Netherlands, where I really have a focus on, uh, on um, uh, physical and information security. Um, and here in Australia, that's uh, um, the uh, Protective Security Framework, um, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, and also um, a whole range of uh, information security uh, management frameworks, uh, both uh, the local uh, information security manual as uh, SOC2, for example. Um, and um, yeah, I'm somewhat of a utility industry expert uh, with the work that I've been doing for energy and uh, water utilities. Now, I'm based in Australia, as I mentioned, in Adelaide, which I think is uh, the best city in Australia, but there are not a lot of people who know it. Now, when we talk about uh, information security, I think the first thing to clarify is that there's a difference between uh, cyber security and information security. So information security is the whole spectrum and cyber security is a part of that. Um, when we talk about um, information security, information security management system, then we talk about a framework of policies, procedures, and technical measures designed to manage, monitor, and improve an organization's information security. And it's really about uh, having a systematic uh, approach uh, to basically uh, ensure three things, which are confidentiality, integrity, and availability of uh, an organization's uh, information data assets. We also call it the CIA triangle. Um, and it's about people, processes, and technology. Um, important to note here is that it's not just uh, about data, uh, it's also paper-based information. Um, it can be intellectual property, can be knowledge, uh, conversations and when we talk about data it's not just your um, hard drive but it's also the information in the cloud um, and removable media such as uh, uh, USB sticks and uh, some examples of data uh, which are considered to be very sensitive are personal health uh, information um, and uh, uh, obviously the PII so that's uh, uh, or credit card information uh, medical records, social security numbers, and uh, contact information, for example. Now, if we look at some good developments in uh, uh, the information security domain, I'd start with saying that uh, uh, encryption has really improved. Uh, so it's uh, much more sophisticated and widespread, which makes it much harder for uh, any adversaries to intercept and uh, decrypt sensitive information. Um, Multi-factor authentication is also the standard now. Uh, so before, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, you could log into your bank just with your password. Now you need at least uh, um, a text or other um, authenticator app to uh, um, access your data, which adding, um, which adds another layer of uh, security. Um, another um, great development is that more and more information is held in the cloud. And these cloud providers, such as Google, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft, are really investing in security measures to protect uh, data and prevent access uh, in a way uh, and with budgets that go far beyond uh, what we would be able to do ourselves if we manage the data ourselves. Um, the increased awareness um, of the information security risks is uh, definitely um, a good development. And there's a lo lot of research uh, that's happening. Um, and another uh, great development is that governments are introducing improved legislation. Uh, examples are the, uh, the GDPR, for example, um, in the EU a couple of years ago. Um, and because they're enacting these new laws, um, um, yeah, companies are somewhat, well, it, it's mandatory to look after their information security. It's not just a financial or reputational risk anymore, but also a compliance risk now. And the final good development, um, I'd say, is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, which we can use to um, improve security um, in various ways. And I think uh, one um, 
example that, that uh, it's a bit of a hype but what most people um most of you might have heard of chat gpt which is a sophisticated artificial intelligence engine and it's uh, referred to by people as the new google wikipedia and a chatbot in one um and this system uh, it's uh, uh they call it the language model um but it can do much more than just uh generating uh, conversational text um it can be trained on huge amounts of data so the current version is uh using all data on the internet until 2021 um which means that it can gather all the information on security threats um uh, uh, incidents that have happened consequences um which is then translated to uh, uh content that can help us to uh, better protect our information security management systems um other things it could do uh, it can assist in incident response by uh, providing more information about the attack and recommended steps to be taken um it can provide personalized uh, security recommendations um and it can also analyze data, write code, or create uh, diagrams. Um, and the most recent development is that Microsoft, they've actually purchased this technology and they created a version which has full access to the internet, uh, um, which ChatGPT doesn't have. Um, so you could ask yourself, ah, could this also be a risk? Uh, so that's actually a question that I asked this uh, very smart chatbot and they confirm that there are actually a number of risks, uh, including malicious use. Um, you can imagine that a human um, hacker um, uh, has some time constraints and can only put as much inputs, uh, data inputs in in, um, uh, in an hour um, with AI is virtually unlimited. Um, and AI is able now to source information on LinkedIn and then use that in their social engineering attacks, for example. Um, now, another thing you could potentially do, uh, and this is where we have the border of the good and the bad, is that we can ask uh, this uh, chat GPT to write a social engineering email, for example. Um, so if you ask it, can you write me a social engineering um, email? It will say, no, sorry, I'm not allowed to do that. Um, um, this is a, a deceptive tactic. However, if you ask it to write an example social engineering email to create awareness, it will just provide you with uh, uh, yeah, an example email that you could use for phishing quite easily. Um, and you could do the same if you need some um, code to find insecure networks. Uh, um, so if you ask the question, I'm preparing a penetration test, can you write a string of commands in Kali to detect insecure networks? And Kali is a penetration testing tool. Um, it will give you um, all the uh, code that you basically need to uh, 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 complete this attack. And it's so smart that even if you ask it to write a poem about information security risks, which is something that I couldn't do, um, it actually comes with a really nice poem um, that you will all have access to the slides, so you can read this uh, at another time. Um, some other concerning... Uh, developments in information security um, include over-reliance and overconfidence in technical controls. Yeah? So organizations invest a lot in, in uh, technology, systems, uh, software, um, while 95% of all cybersecurity breaches uh, and information security breaches are actually due to uh, human error. Yeah? So it's actually uh, a good idea to invest in um, awareness training when you read those statistics. The Internet of uh, Things, uh, so devices are increasingly common. Uh, uh, washing machines, uh, vacuum cleaners, fridges, um, climate control systems, everything is uh, connected to the Internet, which doesn't only mean that they can be uh, operated by a hacker, but those uh, devices can also be used as an entry point to get further access to your uh, home network and uh, potentially even your. Uh, 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 home computer systems such as your laptop. Um, insider threats um, is a significant risk uh, because um, you can put boundaries in your technical systems, uh, but humans will always find a way around it. Um, 
Um, so that's posing increasing uh, risks, especially now people are under more uh, financial pressure. Um, a lack of security awareness, uh, uh, um, I'd say that's not um, a development that, that's something that has always been a problem uh, that people are not uh, aware. A lot of organizations would do one awareness training in information security and uh, 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 maybe someone will get a test phishing email, but that's it, which means that people just become very um, complacent over time, which makes them very vulnerable to attack and with that the organizations they work for. And uh, um, another um, problem is the weak security controls, uh, um, easily guessable passwords, uh, sometimes that's actually created because there's a control where you need to change your password every month. So if you do that, people just change the last digit and uh, um, um, have effectively the same password for a long time. And all those things can be exploited by um, attackers to get access to systems and data. Um, there are also some developments, I'd say, that I classify as ugly, which includes ransomware attacks um, that are impacting critical infrastructure, uh, including um, hospitals, um, energy utilities, traffic systems, and the financial industry. I'll show some examples, but... Uh, um, this is even, uh, there have been attacks in uh, uh, Germany on uh, hospitals, which has actually uh, uh, costed human lives uh, because medical systems were uh, uh, not functioning anymore. Uh, talking about the medical industry, um, a great development is that pacemakers and insulin pumps are now connected to the internet as well, which means that your doctor can actually uh, monitor your health, uh, firmware can be updated, but in theory, these could also be uh, manipulated on a distance uh, by a hacker. And uh, the same applies to self-driving vehicles, uh, boats, and autonomous planes. Um, this is creating a whole new uh, category of uh, security risks uh, because we don't want to uh, think about what could happen with a plane that gets uh, hacked. And all of this is actually, uh, um, it sounds very futuristic, but it's actually already happening uh, where um, water utilities uh, get hacked, chemical dosing is altered. Um, um, yeah, these are uh, things we need to get ready for. Now, how can we get ready for that? And obviously the ISO 27001 standard is a great uh, tool for that. Um, and uh, I think most of you know what this standard is. Uh, it's a widely recognized international standard for information security management. Um, it was updated last year, which was really welcomed by everyone in the industry. Um, and um, it is now much more aligned with other standards, including the ISO 31000 standard, uh, because as Rinsko mentioned, uh, the benefit of using your ISO, um, and basically the library, the portfolio of, of ISO standards, is that they all ask you to look at the, the organization and context before you do anything else. Um, so it's good that that is aligned now as well. Um, aligning the systems with the standard can help organizations to uh, create this comprehensive uh, framework to manage information security risks. And it can also um, help to demonstrate commitment to protecting uh, information. Um, and uh, with that, it also provides a competitive advantage by demonstrating compliance with uh, uh, standards and customer requirements. And it also helps to uh, comply with uh, the legislation I mentioned earlier. Um, to align your information security processes with ISO 27001, there are basically six steps. Um, I'll quickly um, run through these, considering the time we have left. Um, but we always start with defining the scope of the information security management system and the production of a statement of uh, applicability, uh, which is actually a mandatory um, clause in the standard. Um, the risk assessment is the second uh, step. And for this risk assessment, you can use a range of standards, but obviously we recommend 31,000 for a number of reasons, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, it's all about developing and documenting your uh, policies and procedures for this framework. 
um, then it's about implementation of the uh, security controls which are defined in the policies and procedures um, continuous monitoring and review to ensure that all those controls are still um, effective and in place um, including regular uh, reviews of your risk register um, are also important to uh, make sure the uh, system is uh, implemented and effective and uh, obtaining and maintaining uh, ISO 27001 certification for your organization um, uh, again to demonstrate that you have this uh, comprehensive information security uh, management system that actually meets the standards and this is what it looks like in a diagram now um, there are um, standards specifically for um, information security for risk management for information security one of them is 27,005 um, however we recommend using the 31,000 even when you're doing an ISMS eh? and the 27,005 can uh, provide some great inspiration but um, if you use 31,000 uh, it, it's a general standard which you can use holistically for all types of risk on your um, organization um, so that means that if you use the 31,000 standard, um, then it can seamlessly integrate with other organizational risk processes in the organization uh, to look at those strategic risks, operational risk, reputational risks, and other things that Rinska uh, mentioned. Um, and um, uh, so the, the 27,005, as I mentioned, really focuses on those processes for information security. Um, it does provide a more detailed framework however because the focus is more narrow you risk that you um, have a bit of a siloed based approach uh, on risk management um, while the risks in information security often go far beyond the technology team and um, if you follow the 31,000 standard uh, uh, they have a number of principles uh, and if you look at some of these uh, like risk management should be uh, integrated inclusive it's about human and cultural factors these are things that are often overseen when working on um, information security risk assessments um, and by following this uh, 31,000 standard you make sure that you don't um, have any gaps there um, this uh, uh, slide is something that you can um, um, read when you have some uh, time left but what it does is um, it, it basically um, explains all the steps in the 31,000 process and where these steps are actually referred to in the 27,001 standard and as you can see um, yeah there's a great overlap uh, uh, between the two um, which is also why it's a good idea to use this uh, standard for risk management then some um, some final tips um, so when you're conducting um, conducting your risk assessments uh, you can use controls in the annex a of the 27001 standard to identify um, risk sources and another great standard uh, that i often used is a nist uh, standard the um, uh, vision one guide for conducting risk assessments because it has a very comprehensive list of of sources, events, and vulnerabilities that you can include in your um, ISMS risk register. Um, just reinforcing here, uh, try to align your um, ISMS risk management with your organization's holistic risk framework, um, which is much easier if you just use one um, standard for both. When conducting information security um, risk assessments it's important to also include non-IT staff in in those uh, sessions uh, because they are the ones who will be impacted uh, uh, if there's any uh, uh, disruption or other impact and, and not just internal uh, stakeholders but also external stakeholders such as suppliers and uh, customers um, don't forget to subscribe to uh, uh, threat intelligence uh, reports, IT security newsletters, um, and join special interest groups. Um, and another thing you can do is uh, participate in information security forums or webinars um, like these. And uh, yeah, the, the, the final tip, uh, if you want to implement a solid information security management system, is to uh, attain this 27001. 
uh, certification. And it's not just about getting the piece of paper and knowing that you're compliant, but the whole journey in getting that uh, certification is actually very valuable uh, because you'll do uh, an internal audit, which would confirm the maturity of your um, management system and will identify any gaps which you can then address so it really enforces your um, uh, information security posture. Um, so that's uh, that's about it uh, from my side. And I think uh, we'll go to the uh, questions now. Okay, thank you very much, Rinske and Nick, for delivering this very insightful webinar. Just to remind to our audience that PUCB offers training and certification courses, which will show your dedication in implementing and managing information security and risk management frameworks. And most importantly, you will get recognized worldwide. Now, without further ado, we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions that we received from the audience today. I would like to start with the first one, which is for Rinske. Uh, any recommendation on how to break down the upper level categorization of risk? Do you have any suggestions or methodology for developing a breakdown risk taxonomy? Rinske, we can't hear you. I think you are muted. <laughs> Yes, of course. Um, I, I would like to ask you to repeat the first sentence. I just there's something that dropped out there. Can you please? Repeat? Yeah. Uh, any recommendation on how to break down the upper level categorization of risk? Yeah. So that's the, the where we talked about compliance risk, financial risk, strategic right. risk, and operational yeah. risk. Yeah. Look, I actually well, there's an overarching tip I'd like to give everyone. I mentioned there's an over focus on causes on likelihood reduction on uh, preventative controls on on looking at the sources of risk sometimes and not well and maybe not even sources but the actual causes so what are the triggers whereas i actually like categorizing risk also in terms of uh, impact or consequence so that's what i would probably recommend a lot of people to do these days if you acknowledge that even with the most extensive investments into controls you cannot reduce a risk to zero it's always extremely important to have readily available, quickly available, anything that is impact reducing. So all your impact reducing controls. So categorization of uh, what I did before, those, those high level risks is all good at the high level. But I think when you get to the next level down, when you want to break it into more uh, tangible kind of uh, categories, I would try to actually focus on consequence. So whether actual risk have a, not just a financial cause, like for example, fluctuating exchange rates, but also looking at what is the impact. So is that an, an impact on our brand? Is it an impact on customers? Is it an impact on our future of our product suite? Is it, does that make sense? So it's not just about the actual cause or the, the grouping based on causes. So that's probably the first um, answer I'd like to give everyone. Don't just look at what causes a risk. Um, so the next part of the question, can you repeat that, uh, please, Albana? Yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestions on methodology for developing a breakdown risk taxonomy? Breakdown risk taxonomy. Okay, I'm not sure. I'm not so familiar with the word taxonomy there, but um, Nick, do you know what taxonomy might be referred to there? Um, yeah, it's like the hierarchy of risks. So level one, level okay. two, level three. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, pretty much from my side. That would be looking at at consequence. You know, to look at what are the impacts of all those risks and how do, can you group them in that way, or how can you rate them into uh, well, how can you categorize them into uh, a level one or two or three, and what kind of knock on effects they have, which is again very much linked to consequence. You know, a lot of the times we we see risk registers where people have been building those and they actually are not looking at the interrelationship between different risks because of the focus on causes you, you tend to have very specific line items in a risk register like 150 different you know um, risks that are really looking at more the the cause side whereas if you start looking at a consequence you can then also start doing things like uh, mind mapping very interesting tool too uh, mind mapping how certain consequences of certain risks cause different consequences again. So where one thing has a particular impact, what is the knock-on effect or the indirect or direct impacts of that particular risk? You see this is quite well done in supply chain risk management, 
you know, where we look at what suppliers, what downstream suppliers do we have, what upstream suppliers, and actually looking at those interrelations, if you do it well, it's not an easy field, by the way, but it, it is, if it's done well, you see a lot of mind mapping being done between this risk, what does it actually link to, does it link to three or four other risks, you know, and that sort of uh, strategy. But so I don't use so much the tiers, I, I look more at the um, interrelation between different risks. And that is really a qualitative exercise, not so much quantitative. It's not just about giving it ratings and things, but actually looking more at what is the, uh, the yeah, the detail behind it. Hopefully that wasn't too long. Um, next question, Thank I guess. You. Yeah, thank you, Rinske. Uh, the next question is, how is ISO 27005 related to the ISO uh, 31000 while working in an information security management system? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, so the, the question is, how is ISO 27005 related to the ISO 31000? Ah, they are um, aligned, obviously. Um, so they follow similar uh, processes, they follow the same um, uh, principles. Um, the difference is though that it's, uh, um, eh, there are much more references obviously to uh, technical controls and information security in the 27005 um, standard. Um, also good to note is that eh, 27000 it has a whole range of standards. Uh, so 27001 is the standard for the information security management system itself. Then you have 27005 for information security risks. So that there are standards uh, for um, uh, uh, business impact analysis, etc., uh, specifically for information security. Um, and yeah, it's all the same family of standards. And that's also the, the biggest change um, well, one of the bigger changes after the revision in 2022 uh, to align that 27,001 standard more with the 31,000. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, the next question is, is ransomware and phishing risks or threats? Nick? <laughs> um, well, I think they're uh, both. Uh, so the risk of the ransomware attack is that you don't have access to your data anymore. Um, I'd say uh, uh, so. The cause of that risk, losing access to your data, is the ransomware um, attack. Um, that's how I would classify them. Rinske, how do you see it? Yeah, same way. So the threat is is ransomware, whereas the risk is what it does to you. Yeah, so it's the the, the actual uncertainty around it, not knowing if it happens. And then the impact of that on your objectives, because that's the definition of risk, right? So it's the uh, level of uncertainty on your objectives. So that's uh, the threat itself is ransomware in that in that case, or phishing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is: Within the general governance structure of a medium-sized organization, having a separate infosec risk management and internal audit function, who should be responsible to build the risk management framework using ISO 31000 or ISO 27001? As in, what person in the organization should be responsible? Uh... I, I tend to work with team-based approaches with that, especially if there's two fields integrated. So if you're trying to build capacity when it comes to risk management generally, like enterprise risk, and then as a subset, looking at information security risk. Um, in the same way that I built crisis management teams with cyber incident response teams as a subset, you know, I really would uh, would encourage inclusion there and not just seeing it as two different exercises. I would really um, consolidate those activities, whether it's an internal audit function, setting up governance frameworks, et cetera. I would probably yeah, really try to merge those uh, those capabilities together, whether it's some people from the information security field, some people from the IT generic sort of field, some people from the risk management function, maybe some people on the impact reducing side, like business continuity experts, and get them together and then build that framework so that there's no overlap and no duplication between those, if that makes sense. Any, any thoughts on that, Nick, what, what you might answer? Yeah, that no, I agree. And I also think that risk reporting is much easier if uh, uh, both the... Um, holistic as the information security management risk uh, uh, capabilities are 
uh, both following the same risk ratings, uh, for example, um, and the same compliance mm -hmm. categories. Um, you can have different risk appetite statements uh, in your for uh, risk appetite statements uh, for different categories. Um, um, that's certainly possible. Um, but yeah, making risk reporting easier to board, uh, for example, uh, it's another reason why. Um, um, yeah, just using that 31,000 as a basis and then uh, cascade down and uh, uh, yeah, do the same for information security is a good idea. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, this would be the last question. So how can we be sure that cloud service providers will respect their long-term commitments and not unilaterally modify the contract clauses? Is it possible to have guarantees in this respect? Not sure. Are you managing cloud services and, and contracts, Nick, in your work? SLAs and things like that? Well, um, I guess uh, uh, one thing you can do is uh, uh, and you can have supplier questionnaires that they can uh, complete themselves uh, so so they can declare their uh, or an, attest to their information security uh, capabilities. Um, I think uh, the next step is to conduct your own internal audits. Uh, uh, sorry, to conduct your own audits on those uh, suppliers because they can say many things in their contracts, but the only way to know if they're truly uh, um, complying with those contracts is to audit. Um, and I think that the third thing is actually to ask them if they are certified, uh, because if you have the 27,001 certification, there's actually a surveillance audit every uh, year and recertification every three year. Uh, so as long as those uh, providers maintain their certification, uh, you, you know that they um, uh, you lose your certification if you don't uh, take information security, uh, if you don't have sufficient uh, capability in that area. So um, I'd say those three things are helpful there. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, thank you very much. So due to time limitations, we should conclude today's webinar. Thank you once again, Rinske and Nick. So to the audience, please be informed that this session is recorded and will be posted on our website and YouTube channel, along with the slides of the presentation. You will receive the link to access the slides as soon as they are available. Thank you all.